Bill Heard from Hackaday. Today I'm going to be hacking the OBD port on my late model SUV. Just kind of for the heck of it. As I said, I'm going to be hacking away at the OBD port in my car here today. And I'll probably say ODB at least one time during ODBC or something. But onboard diagnostic, OBD. Now, um, that's that funny little uh, connector that's up under your dashboard. As a matter of fact, one of my older cars failed. They changed the laws here in New Jersey. I take it in. They couldn't get to the plug, like in a straight shot. They had it, and they failed me for emissions because they couldn't plug in. So now everything they want to know about my car, I get from the onboard diagnostic OBD port. Now, this here is like a little wireless dongle that you can get to plug in. These are real popular these days. You have your own scan tools that allow you to plug in and uh, learn what's going on in your car. But I had a different thing in mind. Um, what happened was I had installed a usable GPS into my late model Ford Explorer instead of that silly Microsoft thing. Kept using my cell phone to ask where the heck it was. Just horrible thing. So I stick it in. And I get a harness adapter, and I've done this dozens of times, but this time the VSS signal, the video speed sensor signal, was not present in the harness. I didn't notice right away, right? In time. But I noticed when my GPS would show me driving about 40 yards to the right of the actual highway and things. And what happens is the GPS is a combination of asking the satellites from time to time, but also knowing the speed of your car. And so it can do some dead reckoning, uh, especially if the satellite signal is, is weak or, or or whatever so I go to look for the VSS signal and I've had to track these down before this is it's common all right um, you can get it you know it, it's usually in the car somewhere it hangs off the transmission sometimes it, the cable I mean the sensor it's a Hall effect sensor or something and they they sometimes they hang off the wheels for the speed but that's kind of for the uh, the the braking <laughs> I don't want to get I don't I, I, I'm terrified that a microprocessor is in charge of the brakes of my car anyway so let alone messing with that wire and what I found was I couldn't find the VSS wire uh, I ultimately rented the schematics directly from Ford for three days, dug deep into it, found that the VSS wire indeed does not come anywhere near the dashboard. It's not underneath the uh, kick panel where it used to be on some other cars. And in fact, um, the, finally the place I found it was where they had a wire so they knew how fast to make the windshield wipers go. Silly reason, only, but only digital version of the uh, VSS wire in my Ford. Uh, in, in the past, they used to use them so you knew how loud to make the radio, but they, I guess they quit doing that or that's a GM thing or something. So what I wanted to do was make a small circuit board, and this is just an insane little thing if you see the way I did it. I'll show you here in a second. Um, that takes, that reads the OBD port, so you plug it in, leave it in, and creates a speed pulse for a GPS. Big old elephant dragging a mouse, right? Um, so I want to show you how I did that and talk a little bit about the OBD, part, uh, OBD onboard diagnostic protocol and, uh, you know, some of the things I learned while playing with this. Now, here's my first pass at a board that does what I was talking about, which would interface to the OBD port in my car and um, create a pulse, basically. Now, you'll see I, di I did a really crazy thing. I'm, I'm using surface mount for the chips because of the available, uh, uh, the available space here. And then I still used axle through hole resistors and stood them up on end like the old transistor radios did, just simply because I hate hand soldering tons of SMT resistors. So I just don't take up too much room and I, I did get it to fit. But, but this was a full-blown, does all the different versions, ISO and J1850 and stuff, and I'm going to change that, I think. So on board, we have a, uh, basically a UART for OBD, made by, uh, made by OBD Solutions, strangely enough. But it's called the STN1110, the 1110. And basically it takes care of, and I'm going to show this, the schematic here, but it takes care of uh, kind of the protocols for you. And then I threw on an AT Mega 328, like in your Arduino-ish type things. Uh, so it sits on the board. And, now, and so basically what I've done is emulated taking an Arduino and a can shield, right? And this is made by Seed Studio, and you can do that if you want. But I wanted mine to fit in a little box. So I kind of jumped in and made my own little thing, right? 
here's the view of the uh, PC board I made for this video inside my CAD package. Now, I toyed with the idea of doing yellow with black silk screen and two things. One, what if it looked like crap on the video? Yeah, I, I just <laughs> I couldn't risk it. And second, I, I use PCB Way uh, overseas for my boards. These cost me a buck each, and I get them, uh, you know, within a week. Except for black silk screen raised the price to like two and a half bucks each. So I went back to my normal blue and white. So here I am with my normal colors, and you you can see, like I said, I uh, I did this crazy thing of standing the resistors. But you know, once I started trying to make it fit, I I just got lost in trying to make it fit. So, but here's what the schematic looks like. And I'll tell you, never ever do this, okay? Don't cram all the stuff on one page. But with that said, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, again, I get so involved with uh, just trying to make it fit. So I have a processor page with the static protection, or uh, I say, should say surge protection, and the regular page. But there's too much here to try and show you, so I'm going to break it down further. I mean, show you in, in one page. Here's the main part the STN 1110 that I spoke about and again this acts like a UART to convert all the protocols into just a UART it's not like setting uh, registers and having to learn in this case the CAN protocol or the uh, ISO protocols or anything it pretty much does that for you given that you know how to query it using an ATZ type command set like ELM 327 I think is a super er, a subset of it and it actually acts kind of like a modem in some ways. So here's here's that part. And, you know, it's, it's available in a surface mount or a dip. And, again, it takes care of all the stuff for me. This thing costs like $11. Um, so uh, you're paying for the software on this. Now, the can shield I called you, and I don't know why they call it a shield. We call them daughter cards, people my age, and probably shows our age uh, but the you could go with the standalone can controller that's what's on the shield but I'll tell you what you got to learn something about can protocol you've got to learn about extended data frames I think and then at the end of the day nothing says that's the OBD represent you know a version of the protocol it's can protocol and but I first heard of can back in the late 70s early 80s for uh, for um, Automation in, in the factory, manufacturing automation. So been around a while, but I just want to talk to this thing like a UART. I want to get this project rolling along, get a video made out of it. So I stuck with the STN 1110. So let me show you this in a schematic where, where you can see it. So to go through the board schematic in a little bit more detail, remember that OBD is several different protocols, not per car, but the plug has to support it depending on what kind of car you're plugging into you're going to be plugging into in this case you see ford uses K ford modern day ford uses k and high speed uh but it used to use one of the uh one of the isos and so or i'm sorry one of the j1850s remember that we have a j1850 variable pulse width j1850 pulse width modulation variable pulse width the actual uh, frequency will change with pulse width modulation, only the ratio of highest to low change, but there's more involved. For J1850 pulse width modulation, the main thing we see is that it's based on 5 volts. And if we look at variable pulse width, it's a 7 volt creature. Yay! So, right off the bat, one of the things I want to show you is that the way we deal with the 5, 7 volt the, the 5 to 7 volt need is there is a control line that indicates when it's in pulse width modulation mode or, or variable pulse width and that changes the 5 slash 7 volt signal to be or power, power rail to be either 5 or 7 and it does this by changing the ratio of these reference uh, resistances uh, on an LM117 of, uh, adjustable voltage regulator similar to the low dropouts for 5 and 3 except this one is not preset to a voltage it uses these ratios and basically you count on this uh, resistance here to be almost zero when it's on and when it's off you'll see this 240 volt or 240 ohm here we see the uh, J1850 inter interface and one thing I'll say is all of this stuff needs heavy uh, surge protection. The automobile is a horrible place for power surges. 
you have huge inductors, right? Starter motors, all those we call it load dumping. So I'm not showing a lot of that right now. You might see it later, just tacked on the schematics. But if you were going to production with this, a big part of what you can't ignore is how to protect all this from the environment it's in. Also, automotive temperature ranges are just horrible, right? Minus 40 degrees, a hot car was at 120, 130. Leave it in your window, right? Melt. So here's the J1850 though, and you can see that uh, you know the transmitter is it sets basically it's got a low and a high, and this sets the correct references. And then for the receiver, we end up with two halves of an op amp with basically just different thresholds. That's that's pretty much what's going on here. And then these again go into the 1110, and it turns it into a UART signal into ASCII for you. ISO 9142 um, is has a basically when you see a K and an L line that's that's the uh, signals involved in this. It's a 12 volt based protocol, and as it says, this is Chrysler European or Asian vehicles again up till about 2008. Here's the interface for that. Uh, just pull downs and actually the speed of these is important. I have a feeling I, I'd have to check the speeds on the 2222s. By the way, I grab most of this right out of the uh, application notes for the parts. The people that make these parts know more than I do at the moment. If I was a production, designed for production, you better believe I would tear into these to the minutia, right? Because that's, that's how you make things work in production. Here's the transmitter is your basic uh, uh, common emitter um, output. And then it uses a op amp with, again, a, a preset threshold here uh, as a comparator. I'm sorry, this is compare. I've been calling an op amp, which op comparators are op amps, but LM339 is an open collector version that's very good at what it does. And so this is the third part of the LM339, and this is the ISO 9141 protocol. And then we have CAN, and I haven't been showing you the speeds, but CAN is the fastest. They, you could see the speeds, but now, now we're into the high speed stuff. This is since 2008. And we find that it's got a voltage, uh, the high and lows, it, so it's all below 5, but the high, well, it's 4.5 as we see here. And the high and lows are 3.5 and 1.5 volts. You will not build your own key and transceiver most of the time. You will use one. Here's the can transceiver I'm using. Um, I, I, if I go completely, if I make a version of this that's just can based, I'll probably go back to making everything through hole. Maybe I can make it a kit, throw it up on Tindy or something. Uh, but this is a CAN transceiver, not to be confused with a CAN controller, right? This is a whole processor thing. Or, I'm sorry, this is meant to augment a processor, like they show a lot of PIC variants and it speaks SPI. This is uh, just the correct electrical interface to the car. Now again, I'll throw in my things. It's ESD, ESD, ESD. You need to protect these devices from all the crazy voltages you'll find in your car. And, and let alone that you write strange commands to your car and cause it to stall out, do that kind of thing. Now I've been talking way too much just showing you the hardware involved. So I actually want to show you this working. I'll cover more about the actual OBD codes uh, that, you know, PIDs, uh, parameter ID that we send to request information. An OBD bus doesn't just stream information, you ask it things. And the ECU or actually your transmission might respond. Uh, and then there's a diagnostic trouble code, a DTC, and that is, uh, that does originate from the OBD bus tell you it's a problem that your check engine light usually means there's a DTC waiting to be picked up. But first, I just want to show you, remember, I want to go get the speed of my car so I can vary a pulse width. Very simple, right? Well, first, uh, we need a car. Well, doesn't fit in here, right? Plus, you're not going to go out and really work on your car outside and hook strange hardware to it without th knowing it at least works. So I have here a a uh, OBD simulator, stimulator, whatever you want to call it. It acts like a car. I got this one cheap off eBay uh, for it's like 70 bucks or something. You can buy uh, these in the States. Good, good ones from no manufacturers. They're a couple hundred bucks. If you're doing serious work, that's what I do. But I'm making a video here. So if we, if we look at our OBD stimulator here, simulator, it says sim right here. You see, we can pick the various modes, all kinds of them. Right now, it's set mindset for ISO 9141. We'll see if that works. And then here are potentiometers that represent the different things about your car. Remember, I was interested in the speed of the car. And if I turn this, the speed 
actually and shown in kilometers an hour will vary okay now what I just noticed here a bit ago is there's actually the PID written below it 010D so what I want to do is ask this device here about 010D and it should come back with a speed between 0 and 255 kilometers per hour here I've got my simulator plugged into a development board and it's made by OBD Solutions, same people that made the, the, the chip that's on here in fact here's the chip uh, this is the 1110 this is an 1170 it's a cousin to it here's all the driver stuff that's all over my board here and this processor that I'm just showing here because I lost my Hackaday Pro trinket while I was shooting here so I pulled this one out represents the processor that's down here but what makes this good for shooting here today is it's got a built-in USB to serial adapter and let's see if we can pull the speed out of this thing here on the left I've got my terminal program uh, hooked to the virtual COM port on COM6 and it's got the reset message uh, I will warn you this has kind of the standard old problem of carriage returns and line feeds not kind of mapping each other but when I give it an ATZ just like an old modem it gives me back my message now remember this is all about getting the value for 010D which is right here and that is the speed uh, right next to it's the RPM actually 010C but let's go ahead and ask for the current speed and what it's done is it, it's overwritten itself but it replied with 410D and then B5 which happens to be 181 I looked it up ahead of time and sure enough on the speed here it's set for 181 kilometers per hour if we go ahead and change the speed and ask it again now we get a DD so uh, all this to get that little value to pop out of the o OBD bus of your car. So as you saw, I was able to extract the, the speed as a byte without knowing CAN protocol, anything like that. Just a little bit of ASCII, and that's why I did it that way. Again, designing for production, I'd, be, well, I'd want to do it the cheapest way, which means you invest more up front in your design and less in using other people's uh, expensive stuff. But that's a cool little chip in my book. So um, next time, I'll be working back on this thing here again, uh, doing the software for it. And I'm going to probably treat this more like a real-time operating system, meaning I want to use, I don't want to just sit in a serial loop. I want, want to use the counters and timers to create those pulse widths and, and do so in a way where it's rooted in, you know, relates to the crystal frequency, right, real time. I'm a hardware guy, right? I like in-circuit emulators, and hopefully I design this sucker good enough that I can actually in-circuit emulate uh, and not just do a bunch of printfs, because I'm a lousy programmer. I like in-circuit emulators, and so I should be able, on this one, I think I can use the debug wire pin. So Bill Heard from Hackaday, uh, part one of two parts of OBD, this being the hardware stuff. Next time we'll do a little bit of software for creating our pulses so that we can uh, drive a GPS off our OBD bus. So, Bill Heard from Hackaday, and we'll catch you on the next part.